And we have an architect, we've got Chris Ford, who's our VP of Architecture and General Manager for Asia Pacific, to ask the questions from the floor. Chris, welcome. Uh, well, gentlemen, from Barrow and Furness to Edinburgh, thanks for coming out. It was, uh, we were very fortunate, Alan, myself and Paddy were invited up there to meet with these gentlemen a while ago. And I must say that sitting around a coffee table, discovering that this was going on, I think I was grinning for a month afterwards, actually. And um, it was, even today, the, the humbleness that you've seen, for example, that of John and Matthew, about, look, we're really sorry we took your stuff off the internet and customized it for our use. Is it okay? Well, yeah, it's okay, gentlemen, so thanks very much. Uh, on to the questions then. Um, there are quite a few. Um, I'll just ask them generally, and whichever one of you chooses to answer will be fine, I think. Uh, did your journey uh, enable a, a set of measures, objective metrics, repeatable, reusable for the phases that you went through? Has that been a consideration? Um, and as you went through this process, in the operation space, has it actually changed the way you've built boats? Go for it, John. Yeah, uh, as an ops guy, KPIs are built into me. I've measured everything since the years of 20. So when the ops director at the time, uh, just prior to Ollie, wanted to get on this journey, as I said before, he was really focusing on the hobbyist, extension of university people that just like doing things. So he wanted projects in place with embedded KPIs so we could measure the journey right through this process. Uh, as, as Matthew said, there was a lot of in-flight projects going on at that time. We, we KPI'd every stage, and I've just found out of somebody uh, why some of them KPIs were quite difficult to get through. Again, we'll be having that conversation later on, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, the KPIs is a major part of it, it absolutely is. And as it changed, yeah, it, it has changed the way that we we resource around building the boat, we, we it, it structured the manufacturing engineering element of this, it allowed us to structure it, uh, pull the scope together, but again there is KPIs embedded right through. Uh, is that okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to, add to that, a big part of our business journey that we're on and operations transformation is at the heart of, of this, is really starting to work through more systematically the performance measurement we need for a modern day shipyard um, and how we do in a more systematic way measure the performance of the literal throughput. Um, the business has everything from raw flat steel coming in at one end of the shipyard and a, a fully commissioned um, self-sufficient nuclear submarine um, sailing at the other end. So it's a complicated set of measures to keep all of that understood. And the operation transformation activity has been key to bringing a lot of those measures to life. And we've still got a lot of work to do in that area. But the, but the systematic measurement of both the core process and the improvement of that process is critical to us. So, so I suppose just to add to that, there are some elements of this that are quite difficult. A lot of this, uh, the 27 projects, it were aimed at culture and behaviour and, and eight, 65 sessions uh, brought that out, the X and Y generation, they're not coming together, they're going apart, uh, that really came out strongly, so to, to get a KPI in around leadership and culture is quite difficult, because throughout this journey, as I said, the X and Y generation are really, really going apart, it shocked me quite a lot. Okay. Matthew, you, you mentioned that um, in the capabilities you were measuring the average target versus the current maturity level. How, how did you actually measure that? So, essentially, we took the operations function, as I said, as of 10 kind of key departments within that function, and you know, it was a qualitative review rather than a quantitative mm. kind of method. You know, it was understanding their best position to understand the performance of their department, and their you know very open and honest conversations around that of where they believe they were against those capabilities versus on the scale. Where, of on the scale. So we. We put some nominal kind of sentences around each of the scopes of work to discuss what a, an absolute minimum level would be. So 
mobile IT access, for example, we put a, a nominal statement on there, you know, all team leaders have Blackberries. Well, we know today that that's not true, so therefore we could, we know we're not even there, whereas an optimum state would be actually in-flight information at the point of execution, and you know, is that what we want? Do we need to get there? And we mm -hmm. built that up around all of the 27 capabilities to really drive that home. And it, what we found interesting, actually, was that a lot of the issues and, and were similar in areas. There were key areas that had differences, but actually it was, there was a lot of similarity across them. Great. Chris? Uh, Stephen, this one's directed specifically to you. For the digital approach componentry that was listed earlier, um, and the EA, or the architecture approach you've adopted, uh, do you go as far as delivering architecture descriptions for the technology components, if you've got that far? Uh, broadly, yes. Uh, we've, we've introduced um, a full architectural roadmap and a full um, catalogue of definitions covering the process architecture, the application architecture, the information architecture and the technology. Um, and we, have, we call that our enterprise architecture repository. And we use a series of um, techniques now to create an architectural definition of a project so that we can be really clear which aspect of the business infrastructure we're dealing with. So we try and get some consistency across the full architectural definition. Um, and we try and use that. That's now being used as a good framework for all projects. So uh, obviously we, we're discussing here predominantly a non-technical project around operation transformation. Um, some of our more technically enabled endeavors uh, use those descriptions to try and keep together a cohesive kind of definition of architecture. And that's been a key part of our maturity to getting the, an architected approach in, embedded in the way we work. Paul, would you add anything else to that? Well, so the only thing I'd, I'd colour that with is, um, uh, you know, the, as a as a, a an organisation, um, a lot of the technology is provided by third party suppliers. So Capita is an example, or CSC, um, and so there's a level of abstracted architectural definition, um, but the detail crosses an organisational and contractual boundary, so, that, so they're tied up with some of those as well. Yeah. So BAE Systems operates as the design authority and the design assurer of all of our architected solutions. And um, we hand over those responsibilities for detailed specifications to third parties where it's most appropriate. So in the business capabilities, you had a couple of things that I wouldn't mind a bit of explanation of for, for me. Everyone else might have understood it, but for me. So one capability was just culture, and another one was management by key stage. Can you talk a little bit more about those? Just culture is a safety leadership initiative uh, where there is a, it's about recognition for good safety activity but there is also a route where if it's not going so well there is a different route it's it's a hr safety linked solution but it's very a lot of the themes today was leadership just culture is really focused it's about talk safe managers talking to people leading by example it was it was a late inclusion to the capabilities so it had to it caused matthew and i a couple of problems but uh yeah, so that's what just uh, culture is. What was the other one? Management by key stages, how we, we build our submarines in five key stages. Uh, and this was about, uh, at every stage of handover, there is a handshake. Uh, mm -hmm. This was about better definition of that handshake, better scopes of work. If you're traveling work, what does that mean? It's, so it's like business to business trading, but getting the structure, the business structure in around that so you're not transferring work mm -hmm. without the budget. It's more of an ops thing. Mm -hmm. If you want mm -hmm. me to do something for you, bring your checkbook. It's one of them, you know. So that, that's what that was, definition of build stages. Okay. okay. And the, the other thing that struck me, I think, from Paul, in your presentation, it was more the end justifies the means, but TOGAF and everything else that we heard was all about process and making sure you, you actually do go through the process and don't just leap to the solution. Say a bit more about the dichotomy of those two. Yeah, so um, I, what I meant by that was, um, the, you know, there's a very real set of uh, challenges uh, for these guys to deliver on. Um, you know, what was interesting is 
uh, never at any one point were they interested in becoming experts at TOGAF or architecture. Um, and I'm not saying that people do, but you know, at the end of the day, I can remember sitting down and, and doing my first TOGAF-based project, and I was worried about the spec, I was worried about the process, I was worried about what I was learning and, and how I was developing as an individual. That was quite key to me. Um, and so the process and the framework and how, that, um, how I used it was, was uh, a big part of my development. Um, and, and these guys were doing it, and you know, they were a bit snapping off the sides as they were ramming it through the door, if you like. You know? And it was like, that kind of doesn't matter. I've got to let that go. Because actually, what they are doing is getting a whole bunch of people in to an office that's got a load of paper stuck around the wall, lots of charts, lots of very, very rich uh, set of information. Um, and um, I don't want to kind of overplay the stereotypes, but a lot of these people would turn up with their overalls and their hard hats on and, um, and would probably not necessarily be in the right mindset to be taken through something that said, this is what you need to be doing, this is what you need to be worrying about. When that very morning they might have been told, we've got to finish this task today, we've got to sort these problems out, this kind of issue. So big challenges. So these guys had to kind of bring them in, into that environment, and make sure that they were getting the engagement, they were getting the message across, they were getting the outcomes that they needed, the handshakes with these people to do the right kinds of things. So it was, they weren't worried about the fact that TOGAF might have got a bit, sort of, it was consumed along the way, if you mm -hmm. like. Um, clearly, they used it to structure it so that you can go back to it afterwards and say, actually there's a line of sight, there is a process. If you really, really want to know, you know, the doubters, if they're going to come in, we can lift the lid and, and show you that it, we haven't just made it up. Yeah. Uh, it is valid. Uh, and that's important behind the scenes. So, so there is a dichotomy in what you say, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. you, you highlight that. But, but the, the point was the outcomes, uh, you know, are really what these guys care about. Yeah, I love the pragmatism, very pragmatic. Chris. Um, John and Matthew, I kind of asked John this question over over dinner, so I, I, I think I know the answer, unless it's changed a little bit. Um, how many of you were involved in tailoring and driving this thing since 2013? I mean, I understand that there's a lot of people doing the work at head of department and welder level and that sort of thing, but in terms of tailoring and digesting and regurgitating this stuff into a way that could be digested by the company, what, uh, how many of the people were there? Right, uh, well, the sum total of this, uh, I need to think about this, was me and Matthew. Yep. <laughs> this is it. So we were the ones, hence the, you, you heard me talk about the very late nights and the very dark winter's mornings, and the books that got broken. That was me throwing them at Matthew and Matthew throwing them back. Uh, it was the two of us, so the analysis came out, the two of us, but again, you, you, we can do that and we didn't really want many more people in that fall because it would have got complicated. The key thing is it's the people that you're dealing with, communicating, engaging, they're the important. We, we're quite happy, shut the door, let us get on with it, we'll do the analysis, but the, the key part is the people. So the people doing it, Matthew and I, the people feeding it, a lot. That, that leads me to my, to my next question which is, we heard you talking about the shop floor people, the welders, the scaffolders, but also we heard Steve talking about getting, and you were talking about the buy-in at the board level. How are the conversations different in the environment you're in, between, or are they different with the approach you're taking? I, I think part of being pragmatic with this is to realize that you know, what, you've got to communicate appropriately depending on who you're trying to influence and how you're trying to affect an outcome. So. So the language of, of TOGAF, and particularly the translated language of TOGAF, has become synonymous with how we're trying to organise um, the design of the company to, to succeed at delivering against some of our challenges. Um, and and uh, in the boardroom, um, that language has just started to ex sit and exist quite naturally with the rest of the normal business uh, lexicon that we use when you're doing things like... Um, presiding over the, the, the complex business under which we operate. Um, so at that level, it's, it's become um, just through practicing it. And we have, a, we have formal governance now where we oversee at board level the, the results of these investments we're making through ops transformation through our other change programs. 
and, and the language sits quite comfortably there. And, uh, and even when we bring on board new directors, and we've seen quite a change in the leadership over the last 24 months, uh, we get them on board that quite easily. But we then have to recognise that the guys talked about how we've communicated the vision for the future of the business and through the ops transformation how we've engaged close on 3,000 people. You, have to, you do have to think consciously about how that message lands with those teams. And I've done a number of those personally and John and Matthew have done a lot more as well as the team. Um, but I think it's very important that you see it from their point of view and, um, and it's got to be pragmatic, it's got to be sensible and you've got to try and empathise with, with everybody at the, within the organisation if we're going to succeed at getting them engaged and bought into what we're trying to achieve. So the language does change, John. Yeah. So, so the other thing is all 3,000 people I certainly represent and work with that work for Ollie, they all want to get better, they all want to improve, they all want to fit yeah. pipes quicker. Every one of them, th th these are very, very proud shipbuilders. I still recognise a lot that I started my apprenticeship with. So everything was positive when we sat down. The 8,000 uh, suggestions, problem statements that came out of them sessions, every one of them was digested, everyone was fed back to. So whoever said it, it was fed back. This is the answer to that, this is what we're gonna do. It took a lot of effort, a lot of effort to do it, but you can really disengage people if yeah. they don't get this bit right. Uh, so we put a lot of time and effort into that. You know? And it, it very quickly turns from being a language of intent, let's say, to demonstrable change and delivery. And I think that's the, the balance. You've got, we've, got to, we've got to communicate close to enacting a change, otherwise it just becomes promises and empty promises. And in our business where we've got, I mean, John talked about three decades for a programme, our business runs at glacial pace. So what we try and do is inject pace where transformation is needed and then deliver quickly on a broad front, but in an organised way. So when you're communicating to some, you know, some of the key talent we've got that do some of the most complex welds that you, that you could conceive in a production environment, and we're talking about improving the way they work, it's so important to follow through on that quickly. Um, otherwise, you, you, we will literally disengage. So I think the language quickly turns into action. And that's a, that's a key combination. We've got to keep the activities closely linked with the communication to deliver value. One of the questions here was, um, are you planning on using this architected approach in the implementations? And from what you just said, Stephen, it certainly sounds like that's oh, a yes. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. This is a cradle to grave you know, um, process. And we're, we're, we're wrapping it. BA Systems has a project uh, governance method called Lifecycle Management LCM. And an architected approach um, is completely complementary to the life cycle of the entire program. Whether a program is um, 30 years designing, building, delivering um, seven hunter killer submarines, or whether a program is let's change the operation um, specifically around um, HR, future services, or something. So, an architected approach is definitely in the delivery phase as well as the thinking stages. So, before we go to the Next question, I'd like to change the conversation a little bit, which is that this isn't just a story about a business or an organization or about building submarines. This is a story about a community. Right? So can you say a little bit about the impact on the community, you know, the, the doctors, dentists, bakers and everything else in Barrow when there's a big layoff in, yeah. in this or when there's more employment coming in? Just, just give people a bit of context about that community of people. So, uh, when uh, Steve told you before about the decline, that there was a big gap in submarine building, uh, it's really, really caused us problems. So we had a 10 year gap in submarine orders, which we went into surface craft, which was quite exciting at the time. Believe me, I was on it. We stopped taking apprentices for 10 years. 10 years without an apprentice. We are paying for that so badly now that the influx of key skills in the town has gone. So we've got a 10 year gap in labor skills and to build submarines, it's high top end. 
the area where we live suffered. We brought a lot of contract labour in, but contract labour doesn't put its money in the local economy. It tends to take it back where it lives. Uh, so we are now, we went from 14,500 people down to two. We are now back up at seven, probably get back to about nine. Cool, yeah. Yeah, the successor programme that's coming is very, very demanding. It, it's got a higher rate of efficiency, it's asking for higher skills, it's asking for higher levels of system stuff to support us to do that. So the community is on a journey. We're all on this journey. We take the local community with us. We need apprentices now. We're back up at, I think, 300 apprentices coming in this year. Yeah, that's, So it, it, it hits the local community very, very hard. Yeah, so it's a major part of it, and we do keep the community very, very close to us because we've got to, because you've seen where the shipyard is. It's right in the middle of a town. And we call it Barrow Island. It's not Treasure mm -hmm. Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's there for a reason, so I hope. Is that okay? Sure. I think, kind of, to add on to that, as a graduate who's not from that local area, the complexity of the product that drives people in is changing the environment that, that Barrow in Furnace has, is bringing people from around the country who you know, are wanting to stay, who are setting up home there, and actually changing the dynamics of the, of the town in its own right by what we build. And that influx of graduate, you know, as just, Steve just said, I think we had a 100 graduate intake last year. You know, it's... It's a massive organisation and a lot of opportunity for people to do that. But I just think that in its own right is a positive thing to, to drive forward for the local community. And, and how does the organisation go from 2,000 people to 9,000 people and get everyone singing the same song? With, with some challenge. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have growing pains is the way that I describe it. Um, I, uh, there isn't a magic answer to that. Um, it, it's about being consistent. It's, we have long range programs, that's a big benefit. We have long-term commitments from our customer. So that enables us to create an environment where we can communicate a long-term proposition. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all good, but then maintaining that day-to-day -day in the heat of battle, if you like, where, because no plan survives first engagement with the enemy, then you've got to really be constantly uh, supporting and communicating the long-term plan, but delivering in the near term so people can see the benefits, that we can stay engaged, and we can, frankly, attract and retain the right sort of talent and develop talents for the, for the, next, um, the next generation of submarines. Because we're also looking at planning beyond successor. We're now looking at the maritime underwater future capability. So it's our intention to build a, a truly world-class, long-lasting shipyard. Uh, that, but the proposition has changed in the, in the digital era. Um, People have different ambitions over work style, work location, flexibility, um, levels of capability. The, the general, our skill requirement has gone up since the Vanguard class of submarines and the Trafalgar class in the 80s and the 90s. And as the guys have just reflected on, that gives the town a different skill-based challenge to meet. So we're working really hard now, hand in glove in partnerships with academia starting out at uh, effectively um, key stage two, so that's year six and seven at primary into secondary. So that's where we start supporting the local schools. And then all the way through college, we, we're a major um, user of the local colleges on the Barrow Peninsula and the South Lakes, and then through strategic partnerships with universities. So at every stage of the education process, we've got quite intended designed interventions to help, again, deliver an outcome um, around our skills program that is required for the business. Mm -hmm. Chris. Um, how did you identify uh, the existing capabilities in, to, in order to turn them and map them against different activities and project stages and identify the gaps? This is kind of that two by two that you guys showed, I think. How, how did you go through that process, Matthew, I guess? So, I mean, I think the first point was to identify what projects were in flight in the first place, and that was part of Ollie's three-month kind of go, look, see, understand how the business is operating, what programmes are we trying to change already, what, what areas are the gaps and we're not doing anything in, in. Once we kind of had that baseline of understanding of what, what exists today, it was understanding, okay, for example, the ability to understand we're a business with a profit and loss was one of the abilities under a modern attitude. But in order to be able to do that, actually, you've got to have some leadership changes. You've got to have the right behaviours. You've got to have some manufacturing engineering capabilities to be able to understand what the cost of this thing, of the thing fit in. Cost management was another one of the capabilities. So 
the step really in that area was to go through and understand would this project as the scope of we understand it today help deliver this ability it wouldn't will it, the question wasn't will it deliver the ability in its own right the question was will it support or enable or be part of that transition to that ability once we would kind of done the review the question then was to understand if I now put those five capabilities together in all of the areas that we're talking about will that deliver the ability if the answer is yes then we know that we've got that first stem sorted if the answer was no we then need to understand what aspect of that ability is missing in order to develop and define the capability to fit the gap if that makes sense we did that 756 times so I kind of know the interdependencies quite well because I spent a lot of time looking at them. I think the, the other side that Paul mentioned before was the <coughs> boxes and boxes and boxes of data that we went through and there was a lot. One of the guys we worked with, a colleague is a bit of a, he keeps everything for it's years, awesome. 10 years worth of data of every objective, everything we said we were going to do, every change initiative that we've ever done was all brought out and analysed over and we started to group it and group it and group it down until we got to where we needed to be but it takes time you can't skip that bit and I think the, when we were presenting it out people didn't get that they, they skipped past it but it, it, it was months of reading uh, so you know that bit you have to have the data at hand and you have to take the time to do the analysis if you don't you're going to miss something you can answer a question that you're probably not really ready to answer. Okay. Can I just add an interesting kind of context to it? Because in a lot of ways, you, know, you would want to shortcut that by understanding who else in the same industry has had similar problems. But guess what? There aren't very many comparable industries, you know, certainly not many that are willing to share kind of how they do it. So... You know, starting from scratch, if you like, but starting from the heads and, and w was quite relevant. And a couple of things that are, are really key to that was, to me, that sort of um, haven't been mentioned today, but so conditioned the whole setup is, um, you know, there are very, very few of each class of submarine built. So it's not a big repeatable process. Um, and there's no prototype. There's no such thing as a prototype submarine. Right? Not like a prototype car or anything. You, know, you don't have a test track, you drive it around or anything. So the first one that's built goes into service. Um, and that first of class is the one where you iron out all the problems, basically. Um, and so that, there's a lot of need to, to have done it from first principles, which was useful for these guys to go through because they learned from it, but necessary. They couldn't steal an example from an industry standard. Um, and I think that's uh, very, very relevant. And just to kind of, just to one other part on it, the, life, the lifespan part, and this bit, bit makes it fascinating. Um, they're about to do another first of class build in Successor, starts next year. Um, it's been two decades since the last first of class submarine was built, roughly. Yeah. yeah. So the people who were there, if they haven't left, we're only very junior, pretty much. So the experience of, of doing the same task again is, is just not there. So having to do it from first principles is quite key. I think one of the other things you said to me, Paul, when, when we were initially having these conversations about were we willing to approach each other, you, you said something that stunned me. You said, Chris, do you realize that the young men and women that will man these vessels are not born yet? Yeah. Right. It's a staggering time scale from my perspective. Um, from a number of the questions, uh, it, there's an impression maybe that you have secretly got a whole bunch of technology tooling in your back pocket um, that is somehow, yeah, <laughs> you, that is somehow supporting it. Can you talk a little bit about whatever tooling you use, not for building the, 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 the product, but for the architecture approach you've taken and what tooling you've used, if any? Um. Not a lot is the short answer to that. I mean, we, we have, we have uh, BAE Systems has every single architectural repository tool you could shake a stick at. Um, do we use them effectively for our business architecture? I would suggest not, really. Um, I think we, uh, where we're using architected approach literally in the business, as, the, as we've been promoting in, in this conference this morning, 
I mean, it is with sheer hard work and, let's say, more traditional methods under which the, the definition and the, and the analysis and the scoping is done. And I think you saw some evidence with the pictures there. Of course, we've got to get smarter with that. And as we're going forward with a, an architected approach, we are, um, you know, my, my gang of IT teams are bringing some better capability to bear with some advice from, you know, people that want to sell us some software. Um, and, uh, and, and we are starting to look at how we can get slicker, get more effective at, at exploiting tooling capability to deploy capabilities like Toga. Um, but I would say today we're a bit, we're still quite Heath Robinson with the actual, um, let's say the, the automation and the sophistication in, the, in managing the, the process of architecture. Um, but we'd rather put our effort at the moment on the outcomes and the results and then we'll fine tune our architectural method and that's kind of the next, next frontier. Um, but, and we just, I just got to answer a phone call to a salesman at some point who's trying to sell me some software. Um, okay, so what was the aha moment that led you to map the TOGAF phases to project management terminology? And did I, you? I think the moment was sat with a copy, a black permanent marker, sitting there thinking, I've just been asked by the head of transformation to work out what this means, and I haven't got a clue. That was, and I sat there, and I looked at it, and looked at it, and looked at it, and at that point went, I need to simplify what it's asking me here. And, and that was literally, my approach was get a pen, cross something out, it literally was anything more than three syllables, cross it out, and it started to make sense. I could digest the, the pure context of what was being asked without the wider terminology around it. Now, there was a danger and a worry that I'd cut that much out of it that I'd made a new sentence and actually just made it say what I wanted <laughs> to say, which is why it was important to get John involved, uh, sorry, John was involved and also to get Paul to refer back to what we'd done. But I think it was the, the moment where we crossed something out and we, I, I could not comprehend what it was trying to ask me to do. And then we crossed something out and it just said, define your vision. Well, we can do that. And that was the penny, that, the, the penny dropped at that moment. Went, well, we, we can do that. And if we can do that with this stage, then actually we can do that with the other stages. And that's, I think, where we started to pick up the process. Yeah, I think I need to set a bit of context with this. That Please don't think we had lots of time to do this. I had an ops director banging on the window of an office screaming at me, what's the answer? Every day, every single day. And when I mean screaming at me, he needed the answer now. Because there's funding behind this. There's programs. Yeah? There's people. There's efficiency. So when we did that, that was done with a ops director with his face against a glass wall like that saying, get a move on. So that was quite tensioned. That wasn't just free thought. It was free thought with a thumb on my forehead. Okay, so just to set the context. That's what you call motivation. Something like that. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, in-flight stuff, change, things like that. Um, how do you balance... Uh, how did You went through this problem you mentioned, both of you, dealing with developing the strategic intent. At the same time, you've got product delivery going on um, with in-flight or projected projects. How, how have you dealt with that and how are you dealing with it? With great difficulty, to be truthful, because again, the same ops director was the same guy throwing in-flight projects at me. So, no, what we did, uh, if I pick one out, like manufacturing engineering, which is something the business has started to change through into an authority-based solution, we took that out we realigned it, we did some things with it tactically, but we then started a Torgath Torgath approach on that. Sorry. Okay, so we have now four or five projects coming off the main pack that are all going down a Torgath route. So to, to align them, yeah, we had to do some tactical things while Matthew was away beavering in the room going through books. I had to go out and do the not so nice thing, which was called managing, and go and sort them out which means we had to take people on a journey. I had to move people around, I had to change some things, certainly in the manufacturing engineering world. So we had to take it head on, to be truthful, and just deal with it. 
but it is an interference and it does take you away from your primary strategic goal so you've got to be careful with it and it happened on more than one occasion where Ollie was in a room trying to do something and the ops director came in and we had to quickly take stock, change direction for a couple of weeks, firewall Matthew to keep doing some of the analysis while I went and sorted out plan B and then get back on track, get that sorted out but come back on track. But don't mix the two because it is so is disastrous. Is the ops director now on board? The ops director has now changed to Ollie, so that's made life a lot easier. <laughs> the last ops was director was on board anyway. He, he really supported and supported it really, really well, and he was a strong mm -hmm. character, so it's what was needed. Mm -hmm. We said in the presentations mm -hmm. before that the leadership through your, your peer, your peers, and, the, and the, either the director or the key stakeholder is absolutely vital for this. If you don't have it, it's just going to, you've got no platform. So mm -hmm. you've got to get that platform of why change and get not us saying it, you want the ops director saying that. Mm -hmm. And he did, and he said it loud and clear to all uh, 3,000 people. I mean, he stood in front of 41 sessions, all in two weeks, and he stood up for an hour in every one of them and gave that transformation message out. And the slides he used were Matthew's slides that he put out before. So that's the level of commitment you need, what we needed. Okay. How do you apply that level of kind of sense and respond and adjust to the vision? I mean, do you go back and assess? I mean, yeah. and how many times did you go through figuring out you got it wrong before you've got it right? And have you got it right for how long? The early stages, to be truthful, it took us a couple of months to get through the early stages. And once we nailed it, we nailed it good and hard. We, we've kept that strategic intent. We've never gone back and changed. One of the abilities or one of the uh, strategic sort of messages, we haven't gone back. We've changed the project, aligned it back to that because fit for the future is what we've got to be, you know. So, and we've actually changed some of the projects quite a lot. But uh, we've held, we put the effort in at the beginning to hold the strategic intention, really put the effort in, which was a big lesson to learn. I think key to get you know one of my worries you know around this strategic tactical kind of headbutt was around it's okay to put a tactical fix in place if we need to do that and that's what the demand from the business is that's the right thing to do we've also got to ensure that we keep our strategic intent in place there's so much danger to be able to go oh well actually the strategy is to do a but at the moment something's happening well we'll fix that problem and we'll forget the strategy and that's what we didn't do. We ensured that, yes, we've put tactical fixes in where we've needed to, which might have changed the scope of work, but we still kept that strategic intent. So we're working towards that strategic intent as well as putting those tactical fixes in place. Is there, um, you mentioned the HR organization within uh, the maritime submarine systems area. Is there any interest outside of your own division in adoption of this approach across BAE? Yes, uh, I mean, we, we, one thing the BAE encourages through our operating framework is to share best practice and, and LFE, learning from experience. And the life cycle management process I mentioned earlier helps facilitate that all the way across the PLC. Um, and there's already been engagements within the operations areas into military air, which is where we, we obviously design and develop and deliver the fast jets for the, for the Royal Air Force. Um, and our sister businesses in, in, this, in the, those that make ships, not boats, and those that surface, service ships. So that there's, there's a high level of appetite for the business to continually learn. Um, and I'm glad to say that um, in the past, uh, the Barrow business has sometimes been seen as a little bit uh, behind some of those other businesses. But now we're right at the forefront of, of practicing, promoting, and sharing some of these better practices. And, and in fact, I think... Paul, you are with some of our colleagues in maritime services, just helping them with some of the learning and adoption. So we, we do that quite robustly across the company. Um, I have just one very simple question. Paul, how much was your engagement here in terms of time and investment as a, as a, a reference point? Uh, negligible, really. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't want to take any of the credit away at all from what the guys did because I didn't do it. So, um, it, it, the model was a bit unusual in that actually I was working for Steve around digital strategy and innovation pieces. Um, and uh, Ollie 
uh, being a bit cheeky and someone I once knew kind of just sort of poached me every now and then in, in, in my spare time because um, I was around on the site in a lot of ways. So, but, but even then, uh, a very small uh, amount, a number of conversations and, and kind of distilled uh, uh, guidance pieces. I, I couldn't possibly come up with a number. I think one of the key parts of, of it all, though, um, and uh, I know this sounds emotional, but, but the key part was there's a lot of context that you have to understand about the problem and the challenge. So really, it was about not letting that get in the way because if you didn't have some empathy for the situation and what was trying to be achieved and have any understanding of the business, it wouldn't have mattered how good the architectural advice was because it, would have, it wouldn't, have, wouldn't have taken root. So, they needed to, so that, that was the part. And, and frankly, that's taken nearly five years' worth of investment. That was the end of the written questions, Alan. Yeah, so I think that's been fantastic. Um, the whole morning has been fascinating for me, and uh, I can see applications for other businesses. So just to wrap up, it, given your respective positions in an organization, what, what a, what's the one piece of advice you would give to your counterpart in another organization? Um, so, so from my point of view, I, th I think it's be determined and don't give up. Um, those are probably two overwhelming characteristics. But, but also, it's you've got to move forward with credible delivery and 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 always be prepared um, to to take the challenge, if you like, because businesses, um, certainly in our business, businesses are very good at jumping on the next problem and just dealing with things tactically. Mm -hmm. It takes a bold business, a brave business, to try and confront things more strategically. So, so never give up on those messages. Be pragmatic with your application. Don't become academically abstract from the real problem. I mean, otherwise you will literally become irrelevant. Um, so stay practical, stay near term. And ultimately it's about delivering benefits and delivering value. So really think about how you measure that, how you communicate it, and how, and how you can then influence and gain confidence and trust through demonstrable application of a pragmatic use of toe gaff and principles like that. I think for me, being a very junior member of this organisation, it's about taking a risk. And, you know, I was asked to look at something and review a document that I'd never heard of and, you know, digest it and come back with my interpretation of it. And I think... <laughs> From a, a junior member of the team, the opportunities that that's now opened up for myself, you know, being sat here today doing these presentations and taking these questions, having that, you know, ability to take a risk, do something new and actually, you know, interpret something into a new manner. And I've definitely taken a lot from the, from the architectural framework, you know, and as I've said, and it, John's constantly firing questions my way, projects, and the first thing that I ask myself is, why am I doing this? Because once I can contextualise what I'm doing, I can move forward with my delivery of the, the strategy and, and the implementation of it. God, I could be here for hours on this one. Uh, the, the key one for me is, I've, I've said it, that you've got to get the beginning sorted out. You've got to get why change sorted. We're on our fourth main tour gap uh, project uh, but there's loads of small ones underneath it, and we always start with the why change. You get it nailed. Uh, Paul mentioned Ollie before, get him to write it down. What does it mean? Go back, check for understanding, then move on. You know, There's the clarity uh, needed when you are presenting this stuff back. Is you've got to keep your eye on it because you can lose people. Present. We stealth this in all over the place. So uh, we present to people a lot about this is what we're doing, this is where we're going. We don't mention an architected solution, but we present it in the same structure. So we've got people used to saying, well, where's my change at? Why haven't you done my change first? We've got them doing it. So there's that, but it takes a lot, a lot of effort. You've got to commit to this. We committed to it. Ollie looked at us and asked us to do it, and we gave him our commitment. And again, one thing you'll know about ops people is we are, if we commit to something, we'll see it through. Mm -hmm. So we are emotionally connected, and yes, it was emotional. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Um, I, I was just wondering which hat to wear in answering the question. So um, I, I, I think it's fairly straightforward. It's interesting to be asked this in front of my client, but. Um, 
<laughs> what I'm going to say, actually, in, in, in all seriousness and sincerity, the, uh, for me, um, it's do not tell them what they want to hear. Um, I think you have to tell them exactly what they need to know, uh, whatever, however palatable that is at that point in time. And that's the only way to maintain that kind of um, uh, integrity with the, with the piece. And that's it. Thank you. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I have. The whole morning has been absolutely amazing. So please show your appreciation to our great speakers and panel. <laughs>